Welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is Maria Blaise Costello and thank you for taking the time today to join us for a very informative webinar. The topic today is Renewable Thermal and RPS and this webinar is being hosted by the State Federal RPS Collaborative and it's also being co-sponsored by RIMA, the Renewable Energy Markets Association. So I'm going to give folks just another few seconds to log in. We have a pretty good audience signed up to attend today's event, so we'll give them just one more minute and then we'll start with some housekeeping slides. Okay, so let's get started here. The first thing I'd like to do uh, is go over a quick housekeeping slide with everyone. You're either connected using a telephone or you're listening to us through your computer's VoIP, uh, either through a headset or your computer speakers. Using VoIP will allow you not uh, to avoid telephone charges, but if you'd like to avoid, if you'd like to use your telephone, please do. Um, please enter your PIN on the phone keypad. You will all be in listen-only mode again, so we won't be able to hear anything you say. So feel free to use mic and speakers if you have that option available to you. Simply select mic and speakers on the audio box. We're going to ask that you submit your questions at any time today um, during today's broadcast by typing them into the question box. You can type them in here and then hit send. They'll be queued up and we will uh, go over the questions and present them to the guest speakers as time allows following both of today's presentations. So please at any point enter your questions by typing them into the question box hit send and we'll be happy to ask them as time allows following today's presentations. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available probably by the end of today on the CISA website. The URL is there uh, where you can find the webinar um, tab on our home page and also under webinars there. So you can find this webinar recording and any others that we've had on our website. So with that I'd like to introduce Warren Leon. Warren is the Executive Director of the Clean Energy States Alliance and he's also the Project Director for the RPS Project. So Warren, please go ahead. Good. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, before we start the presentation, I want to tell some folks who may not be familiar with us about the Clean Energy States Alliance and the um, RPS Collaborative. CESA as we affectionately call the Clean Energy States Alliance, is a national nonprofit organization that works to implement smart clean energy policies, programs, and technology innovation. We work primarily at the state level. And at our core, CESA is a national network of public agencies that are individually and collectively working to advance clean energy. Next slide, please, Maria. And one of our activities um, that we coordinate is the State Federal RPS Collaborative. And um, this is an effort that receives funding from the Energy Foundation and the U.S. Department of Energy. And it's open to anyone who's interested in renewable portfolio standards. Um, it includes state RPS administrators, federal agency representatives, industry representatives, um, service providers, utility representatives, uh, folks from renewable energy certificate tracking systems, and others. And what we do through the RPS Collaborative is we advance dialogue and learning about RPS programs. Uh, we share best practices. We discuss common issues. We produce a free monthly newsletter which tells you about important things going on out there in the wonderful world of RPS. We have webinars generally once a month and we have an annual summit. Um, so if you're interested I encourage you to sign up for the RPS Collaborative and you can see the um, URL for doing that. For today's event, we're uh, fortunate to have had the um, help of the Renewable Energy Markets Association in setting up this event and in promoting it. And I want to turn things over for a second to Joseph Seymour of the Renewable Energy Markets Association 
who will let you know about that organization. Joseph. Thank you, Warren, and thank you, Maria, for this opportunity. As uh, Warren, Warren said, I'm Joseph Seymour. I'm the policy coordinator for the Renewable Energy Markets Association. And we're a nonprofit trade association based in Washington, D.C., but our interests are broad all across North America. Uh, our mission is to expand the use of clean, renewable energy in the voluntary and compliance markets. And as part of that mission, we track, we track modifications in renewable portfolio standards, hence the interest in the co-sponsorship of today. As the slide here says, we do represent all aspects of the renewable energy industry, from utilities to green power marketers to manufacturers and nonprofits interested in seeing water use of renewable energy in the voluntary and the compliance markets. And the next slide, Maria, you'll see our membership is, uh, is composed of, of many of the uh, of many of many brands and companies involved in this sector. So again, I want to thank um, Maria and Warren for this opportunity to delve into the proposed and new changes to renewable portfolio standards. And if folks have questions about REMA's activities in the voluntary the compliance markets, I believe my contact information will be shared at the end. If not. It's J Seymour, S E Y M O U R, at ttcorp.com. So, Warren and Maria, back to you. Thank you, Joseph. Well, let's get into today's presentations. Um, you know, we're focusing on renewable thermal and RPS. This is a topic that has gotten increasing interest, and we're going to hear about one state that is already implementing renewable thermal in its RPS, New Hampshire, and then we're going to hear about um, a state that has been studying whether to include renewable thermal into its RPS and how to do it. Um, we're going to hear both presentations and then we'll switch to questions. While we queue up the slides for the first presentation, let me introduce you to the speaker for that presentation, Elizabeth Nixon. She's an energy analyst at the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission, and there she manages New Hampshire's Renewable Portfolio Standards Program and leads the state's efforts to incorporate thermal energy into its RPS. In addition, Liz manages New Hampshire's Commercial and Industrial Rebate Program for um, solar as well as the Commercial and Industrial Grant Program. Prior to, in, to joining the um, Public Utilities Commission in 2012, Liz worked on energy, environmental, and air emission trading issues in the Air Resources Division of New Hampshire's Department of, energy, uh, Department of Environmental Services, as well as at the Nonprofit Center for Clean Air Policy and at two consulting firms. So let's hear what New Hampshire has been up to. Let's turn things over to you, Liz. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Joseph, for having us today. Um, I just want to start with a brief background on uh, our renewable portfolio standard legislation. Um, the original legislation was enacted in July of 2007. Um, and that legislation established four REC classes, renewable energy certificate classes. Class 1 is for new sources, and that means any source that began operation after January 1, 2006. And that includes wind, biomass, methane gas, hydro, um, uh, new hydro, um, as well as any new capacity for existing biomass and landfill gas. Our Class 2 is our solar PV systems that began operation after January 1, 2006. Our class three is existing biomass, less than 25 megawatts, and landfill gas facilities. And then our class four is our existing small hydro facilities. In uh, June of 2012, our legislation passed uh, the thermal provisions and other changes to our RPS program. And what this legislation did was create a class one subclass for useful thermal renewable energy. At the time of that legislation, thermal was 0.2% of the Class 1 REC requirement. But as time went on, um, we were having challenges, as you will hear about. And so the commission delayed implementation through an order to January 1, 2014. And at that time, the obligation for this subclass was changed to 0.4%. And then this past summer, 
more legislation was passed that made revisions to RPS, and in the thermal provisions that were changed um, were, again, the percent obligation, and it basically ramped up the thermal obligations faster than it had originally. As part of the thermal legislation, it requires the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission to adopt procedures for the metering, verification, and reporting of useful thermal energy output. Now, as I mentioned before, we've had some challenges, and our key challenge has been the metering and measurement uh, portion of this requirement. Because there is no heat meter standard in the United States, um, we have to come up with some standard of our own or figure out the best methodology. The ASTM is developing a heat meter standard, but that is not due out till probably the end of this year. Now, the statute defines useful thermal energy, and that means renewable energy derived from class one sources that can be metered, again, there's the metering, and is delivered in New Hampshire to any end user in the form of direct heat, steam, hot water, or other thermal form that is used for heating, cooling, humidity control, process use, or other valid thermal end use requirements, and for which fuel or electricity would otherwise be consumed. Now, as I mentioned, that metering is the key key for us. Here's just a summary of our, the RPS obligations in percentage form. As you can see, in 2014, the percent obligation for thermal is 0.4%. It goes up to 0.6% in 2015, and then it more than doubles in 2016 to 1.3%. So by 2025, it will be 2% of the total um, RPS obligation. This all translates into um, about 44 megawatt hours in 2014 for the thermal. Again, it jumps again in 2016 to more than triple that to about 147,000 megawatt hours, all the way up to 258,000 megawatt hours in 2025 and thereafter. Now, instead of meeting these uh, percent obligations with RECs, sources have the, op the option of making alternative compliance payments. Uh, and in new for 2014, the alternative compliance payment rate for the thermal RECs is $25.17 per megawatt hour. So in effect, that alternative compliance payment serves as the ceiling price for what reno renewable thermal RECs will go for. The legislation also said what the eligible technologies for thermal provisions are. They include solar thermal technologies, geothermal ground source heat pumps, and thermal biomass renewable energy technologies. Um, and this includes biomass combined heat and power facilities. The biomass thermal facilities must meet emission requirements. And that is for a source greater than 3 million BTU per hour, but less than 30 million BTU per hour. They must meet a 0.1 pound per million BTU uh, particulate matter emission rate. And for sources greater than 30 million BTU per hour, they must meet a 0.02 pound per million BTU. For NOx, a source greater than 100 million BTU per hour must meet 0.075 pound per million BTU. And for sources less than 1,000 million BTU per hour, they must be what's called best management practices. Uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services um, has been translating that to mean basically annual tune-ups and uh, a combustion efficiency standard. For any of these facilities to be eligible to create RECs, the source must have begun operation after January 1, 2013. Now, where are we in the process? Well, as I said, this, the legislation was passed the summer of 2012, but it's taken us some time to um, get through the, the rulemaking. Um, right after the legislation was enacted, uh, in August of 2012, we had, held a stakeholder meeting. Then again, about six months later, in January 2013, we had another stakeholder meeting where we had draft regulations. And then we still didn't have enough 
meet in the regulation. Um, so we hired a consultant that summer, and they uh, spent the entire summer drafting a report uh, on metering and measurement. And that fall, in September of 2013, we held another stakeholder meeting um, on that report. By the summer of July 2013, we had the provisions to allow for these thermal racks to be incorporated into our regional uh, rec tracking system, the NEPL GIS. Um, as I mentioned, we hired the consultant. And then later this fall, they gave us some preliminary language for the thermal provisions. But based on the, the comments from stakeholders on the report and just feedback we were getting, uh, it was all too complicated, so we needed to simplify that. So since then, that's what we've been doing, is trying to simplify that process. Um, and today, you'll get a prelude to what those that simplification will look like. So our proposed approaches for this um, is basically we set a boundary for the thermal measurement, and that is the thermal output will be measured before delivery to the distribution system. Uh, the thermal energy will be measured um, for air and water systems based on flow temperature and specific heat, for steam systems based on flow and specific, specific enthalpy. Uh, and then in terms of the metering, we had to ha had a, a, some sort of standard to base the meters. And as I mentioned, that we don't have a U.S. standard, but there is a European standard. So our consultant suggested we look at the European standard 1434. Now, if a source opts to not meet that standard, then we will allow for that um, as long as the meter accuracy was if, with, is within plus or minus 5%, but the rest, RECs will be discounted. And then we do allow for flexibility, and, allow, and a source can propose an alternative metering methodology. Now, those methods are for all sources, but we do have a provision for small sources, and they can do parametric monitoring. And at this point, we're proposing that uh, a small source is defined as 100 kW or 350,000 BTU per hour. A small solar thermal source will meter the operating hours of the collector loop pump and then base it on the SRC rating of the system, taking into account the shading and orientation losses. For the geothermal systems, it'll be somewhat of a similar system. They'll meter the operating hours of the pumps and base it on the heat capacity and the coefficient of performance of the system. And then for thermal biomass, similarly, it'll be based on the operating hours and um, basically the fuel input, the auger feed rate and the auger feed volume and other fuel input characteristics. Now, as I mentioned, all of these are draft provisions, so we look forward to hearing from all of you of, of any suggested changes or um, any other ideas you might have. As I mentioned earlier, um, those were the, the ways to measure the thermal output. So once you have the thermal output measured, then the uh, facility will need to calculate what the actual RECs are. And there are two discount factors that will be taken into consideration. One is the metering accuracy, and the other is basically the operating energy and thermal energy storage losses. And all the RECs will be reported to our reporting system, the NEPL GIS, in megawatt hours, which one megawatt hour is 3.412 million BTU. The meter accuracy discount factor, as I mentioned, it's based on the actual manufacturing guarantee of that meter accuracy. So for example, if your meter is actual plus or minus 4%, then you will only get 96% of that therm measured thermal output, as shown here. On the parasitic energy discount factors, here is where we got a lot of feedback from stakeholders in that we had actual metering um, proposed in our original draft report, and it just got very complicated. So, um, so here's where we've tried to simplify that. So based on some quick calculations by our consultant, they came up with some default values. 
Um, and again, we're looking for feedback on this as well. Um, solar thermals, uh, the discount for parasitic energy is 3% of the thermal output. Geothermal is 3.6% of the thermal output. And for thermal biomass, it's 2% of the thermal output. Again, there's the alter option that you can actually meter the parasitic load instead of using these default factors. And I believe I mentioned this earlier, this discounting is just for uh, large sources. Those small sources, as we defined before, as 100 kW, um, would not have to take these, this factor, discount factor into effect. Now, the statute also requires us to uh, propose verifying and reporting provisions. So a professional engineer must attest to the thermal energy metering and measurement methodology. An independent monitor must inspect the facility initially. Um, and then the independent monitor must verify and report thermal energy output to the NEPL GIS. There's legislation currently that may affect some of these monitoring, uh, independent monitor provisions, but um, at this point, nothing is final. And because our program did go into effect January 1, 2014, we will allow for certification and creation of RECs retroactively. And once these provisions go in, are issued as part of draft rules, we will issue an order saying how those RECs can be calculated. And finally, um, just what, what do we have left to do? Um, as I say, you just were given a snapshot of what our rules, our draft rules will show. We uh, plan to go to, uh, to issue those draft rules and begin the formal rulemaking by the end of this month. Um, and then uh, before those get issued, our commission approves those, then those get issued, and a public notice gets issued uh, announcing a public hearing and that's when we'll receive comments from the, the public. Once we've received those, about a month after that, or depending how complex the comments are, we will issue the final rule. So in about three to five months, we hope to have the final rule and the full program and implementation. Um, and it, I will, on this page, you can see our uh, contact information. Um, we have a, a web page specifically for the thermal provisions. Um, so there's the link to that. You can contact me, um, Jack Ruderman, who's our, our division director, or Mike Sheehan, who's our attorney working on this. Um, and please send me an email if you'd like to be on our service list and uh, kept up to date on what's happening with these rules. Thank you. Warren, I think you're muted. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, Liz, thanks for a very good presentation. It really shows that uh, there are a lot of factors to consider in setting up a renewable thermal uh, provision in an RPS, and New Hampshire certainly seems to be taking a very careful and well thought out approach to it. There are a number of questions that have come in and I'll ask those at the end, but let's switch now to our second presentation where we're going to look at a state that's trying to figure out what they might do and that's the state of Maryland. Um, Kyle Haas is going to be the present presenter and he's a clean energy policy program manager at the Maryland Energy Administration. What he does is he focuses on deployment of distributed energy resources, thermal energy, energy policy, and workforce development. Uh, he also serves as a member of the Board of Advisors at the Chesapeake College Center for Leadership in Environmental Education. He's a graduate of York College in Pennsylvania and Bree University in the Netherlands. He holds degrees in political science and environmental and resource management um, with a focus on energy studies. He utilizes his unique blend of policy and technical expertise to devise creative solutions to today's energy challenges. 
and certainly the topic of renewable thermal requires um, both policy and technical expertise, and we'll learn what the state of Maryland is thinking of doing. So, Kyle, to you. Thanks, Warren. Can, can you guys hear me clearly? You're good. All righty. Uh, well, I wanted to thank you guys very much for inviting me uh, to share my perspectives today. Um, the state of Maryland is, is interested in targeting all of the ways that we use energy for improvements, uh, be that electricity, building HVAC systems, transportation, that sort of thing. Um, the important thing to note is that, uh, you know, electricity generation is not the only way that we can have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions, sustainable energy, distributed generation, that sort of thing. And while distributed energy um, is usually referred to in the context of um, electricity generation, um, I really believe, and the state of Maryland believes, that um, small thermal systems that uh, leverage renewable energy are a good opportunity for us to make significant greenhouse gas um, uh, contributions. Um, technology like geothermal heating and cooling, wood gasification, et cetera, help to reduce peak load, lowering uh, electricity rates, and ultimately saving money for the end user. So that's why we're interested. Here's some of the background. Um, currently, Maryland's RPS has no holistic means of awarding renewable energy credits for thermal. Um, solar is awarded solar renewable energy credits. Geothermal is awarded RECs. Um, and those are just tier one RECs at 3.412 mmBTU. That's actually done by, um, by modeling using um, some tools that we have found. Um, biomass wood um, is able to generate RECs, but for electricity only and not for thermal. Um, and that's done at one megawatt hour equivalent, uh, 3.412 mmBTU. We're currently working with our partners at the Department of Natural Resources um, and trying to evaluate ways that sustainable forest management can be a crucial contribution to our climate change plan. Um, we, we worked with them to figure out that um, if wood is not used, it ultimately decomposes and uh, CO2 and methane are, are released into the air and we would rather see um, sustainable use of that energy, uh, I'm sorry, of that energy resource um, rather than just allowing it to decompose. Um, and it's an important part of the forest management process. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that um, in Maryland, biomass boilers um, above uh, a certain size, basically medium size biomass boilers are, are currently prevented from being developed. Um, and that's due to some regulations that are left over from the 1970s. Um, MEA is working with a number of stakeholders to um, put forward um, what we think is common sense rules for best available um, uh, control technology. Um, and you know, that's how we the, are kind of multi-pronged approach to deploying these technologies. Um, in uh, our last legislative session, um, Senate Bill 797 and 1084, um, were written, and they were they were initially written to incorporate Rex, um, I'm sorry, incorporate woody biomass for thermal technologies into the RPS. Um, as it was written, it had some potential challenges, um, and we believe that um, inviting the stakeholders to have a discussion that says how can we do this most effectively was the best way to move forward. And uh, what I'll be talking about today was, um, is going to be the recommendations of that task force. Um, so just as, as a bit of a disclaimer, we want to make sure that we say that um, the review that I'm going to provide today is, is of an advisor, uh, advisory task force. So these are recommendations that um, a number of stakeholders came together, um, whether they be environmental stakeholders, state regulators, um, business proponents, uh, technology experts. Um, these are real recommendations that um, we, uh, as a task force, had made to the General Assembly. Um, ultimately, um, this slide is to state that all the members of the task force have their own perspective. So we believe that in a consensus, um, in the interest of consensus, we had made these recommendations, but um, there's always a difference of opinion. So I don't, I don't mean to imply that every task force member at the bottom of our report uh, supports this. Um, and another thing to note is that a bill um, that strongly resembles these recommendations are, has been filed and is being heard in state and House committees as we speak. Um, those bills are Senate Bill 530 and House Bill 931. Um, I'm not going to be talking specifically about those. I'm going to be focusing more on the report itself. 
Um, this is the report. You can access it um, either through here. Um, it's also on the reports and publications portion of MEA's website. The beginning there, energy.maryland.gov, um, is where you can find it. And along the left side, there's an area for reports. Uh, we have a very clear executive summary. And then uh, you know, subsequent 30 plus pages of analysis and justification. So you can uh, bite into that a little bit more deeply. So I'm going to go over the recommendations of uh, this task force. Um, I'll go through them fairly quickly, and then uh, I'll allow you guys to, to ask whatever questions you may have. Um, the first recommendation is that um, we recommended to establish separate tiers that would allow thermal technologies to compete on their own terms. Um, and this, is, this was important to us because um, we did not want to lose um, greenhouse gas uh, reduction opportunities associated with, uh, geother with geothermal or, or any of the electricity generation technologies. We wanted to um, offer an opportunity to expand the, uh, the potential impact that the RPS has to move towards thermal technologies. And we believe that the best way to do that is to allow BTUs to compete with BTUs um, and not to have you know, thermal technologies competing directly with electricity. Um, this also acknowledges the unique and distinct properties of thermal energy and the fact that um, it's inherently a local resource. Um, if you're generating thermal, uh, thermal energy, um, it's very unlikely that you would be transmitting that long distances unless you had a very advanced um, district heating system, um, which is, um, we are looking to promote district heating systems, but um, you know, the point for us was that it's inherently a local technology, and that was advantageous for us. Uh, another uh, benefit to a separate thermal tier is that it balances the need for an effective incentive as well as a minimum rate pay, minimal ratepayer impact. Uh, by allowing for a new tier, we were able to set the alternative compliance payment and uh, requirements for retirement at a level that we felt would balance um, not only an effective incentive for these technologies, but also to make sure that we minimize that ratepayer impact. And I will have more on that in a future slide. Another um, security measure to ensure that we, um, through our good intentions, did not um, have a significant negative ratepayer impact was uh, to limit the, um, the compliance requirement or the alternative compliance payment um, to systems that, um, to RECs that were actually generated. So if we were to set the um, ACP, uh, if we were to set the requirement at, let's say, 1,000 retired uh, T-Rex. Uh, if only 500 T-Rex were generated and were able to be purchased by utilities, we would only require that those 500 available credits were then purchased. I can answer questions on that um, if folks would like at the end. But the gist is this is a, a, a security measure to ensure that um, if not enough projects were developed, that then the utilities aren't required to pay ACP for something that they really didn't have um, any capacity to manage. Um, the third recommendation deals with market creation. Um, and uh, the big highlight here is that it's important to know that um, this is, as recommended by the task force, um, a 2% increase uh, in the RPS through 2024. Um, this includes both thermal tier one and thermal tier two technologies. And again, I'll, I'll speak about that in a moment um, as well. But uh, if you look down at the bottom, you'll see that the maximum cost by design um, is three cents per month in 2015 and 15 cents per month in 2024. We did this by calculating what the, um, what the, the rate impact would be if um, all of these credits were uh, sold at ACP. Um, and that helps us to determine what the maximum potential impact is. And, and keeping that number low while balancing it with um, an effective uh, uh, ACP helps us to make sure that you know, we're not um, creating an undue burden on ratepayers, but at the same time, we, we create an effective incentive. Um, so talking about uh, the thermal tier two, um, there were discussions around this uh, technology focused on black liquor. Um, and that's actually a byproduct of, of paper production. Um, there's a number of discussions going on around Annapolis and the state uh, in general about um, more effective ways to provide an incentive to um, this, these black liquor technologies, um, questions as to whether or not it should exist in the RPS, 
uh, or if there should be a, a different means of providing that incentive. Um, I can say that we expect, um, while those bills, both of them that are currently being considered, have that uh, provision in them, we expect that thermal, thermal two-tier to be removed. And there are a number of discussions um, as to how that's going to be uh, incorporated moving forward. But ultimately, uh, this is um, a big, uh, you know, this is a big discussion, and um, breaking it into separate bills uh, will allow us to evaluate the merits of uh, the pros and cons of keeping uh, black liquor in our RPS, um, and to do that separate from this discussion. So, um, it's not something in particular um, that. Um, we expect to hold up the bill because it is going to be separated, but it is something to take note of. Um, this is the expected growth um, of the industry with these incentives. So um, because we had a number of industry experts on uh, our task force, we were able to ask them, okay, we see what level of deployment um, you're currently expecting and what those projections are. Um, how could an additional X dollars uh, per megawatt hour equivalent how would that impact the market creation? Um, and basically, we pulled together these projections moving forward to see what that impact could be and how many thermal uh, tier one recs could be generated. And that's how we're going to uh, set our um, set the requirements for each utility to retire these thermal recs, and that will be um, portioned accordingly. Um, the point here is that almost everyone can benefit from cheaper heating bills. Um, through a variety of different technologies, whether it be commercial boilers at a school, uh, geothermal technologies at a home, a residential wood stove. There's a variety of different applications, and, and this shows kind of what we're expecting and what the potential is that we could have moving forward, working with our industry partners. This is another uh, slide on market creation. Um, the real point to see here is that, uh, in total, this, uh, this proposed um, solution um, would add 2% to the uh, total RPS. The fourth recommendation uh, is related to efficiency requirements. Um, this is in tandem with uh, some of the new standards put out by um, MDE and some of those new proposed regulations for solid fuel boilers. Um, this will help us to make sure not only do we leverage MDE's ex uh, expertise in uh, emissions controls and acceptable performance, but also make sure that we're make sure that we are pushing the the, the boundaries on um, the most efficient systems, the newest technologies coming out, because we really want to make sure that um, we're providing this incentive, but that we're providing the incentive um, to the cleanest technologies and really pushing the industry and and pushing for efficiency and and um, and better systems for the same amount of money. Uh, recommendation number five is uh, regarding displacement. Um, the goal here is to offset non-renewable non fuels as, uh, as well as electricity. Um, we ideally wanted to make this as potentially inclusive as possible and make sure that um, we are still um, achieving net greenhouse gas reductions whenever possible. The last uh, recommendation is concerning grandfathering, and this is just to make sure that existing systems that have um, uh, have, have basically gone through evaluations to say this is what's cost effective and this is what isn't. Um, previous projects um, were assuming a certain qualification for RECs. So, for example, solar uh, technologies, they would expect in their calculations that um, they are going to receive SRECs. And there was a discussion as to whether or not we wanted to move, or in the recommendations we would be uh, recommending moving solar thermal technologies away from earning SRECs and into these thermal tiers. Um, ultimately, it was decided that um, it was best that both existing and future projects um, for solar hot water stay in the uh, solar tier one. Um, but this uh, recommendation in general says if you have a system that you've been generating, let's say it's a geothermal system, and you've been generating regular tier one uh, RECs, if you choose to stay in the in tier one, you are able to do that. Um, alternatively, they may be able to uh, they are uh, able to re-register as a, a thermal tier one system if they were to qualify. So I, I just I would be remiss not to to thank the members of the task force um, for all their hard work. I didn't want to call them out or put any of their email addresses or names out there, but you can see all of that information um, in the report. 
their names are at the bottom of the report. Um, and we really wanted to thank them for all their participation because ultimately we, we wouldn't have been able to do this without um, the expertise of a number of different institutions. And uh, I think that is it for me. Hey, Kyle. Thank you. Thank Seems you. Like the um, test was did a lot of uh, hard work there. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the um, legislature. Well, I, a number I, of questions have come in, and I will try to go through them um, before I ask questions of Elizabeth and Kyle. There's one question that came in, two questions that came in that um, I can answer. One question asked about whether the presentations will be available to um, share. Up on the Clean Energy States Alliance website, in the RPS Collaborative, we will post the recording of this webinar. We will also uh, post the slide decks from the presentations, so you'll be able to see those there. Uh, one other thing is, following up on this webinar, we are going to produce a short report on the topic of renewable thermal and RPS. And for that report, we will be um, including a summary of all the states that have um, renewable thermal in any way in their RPS. So in terms of questions for the speakers, the first one actually, I guess, goes to either of you. And that is, would PV qualify for, well, I guess this is more for um, Elizabeth, would PV qualify for the thermal class one if it is used to power an electric water heater air conditioner or heat pump? No, it won't. It has to be a specific, it, solar thermal would, but not the indirect application of that. OK, and here's another one for you. For small systems that are using estimates based on ratings instead of metering, is there any ongoing verification? Yes, in the same way that the large systems, the independent monitor still has to verify it. So like for the, um, say for the thermal biomass, they might have, they would, prop the independent monitor may want to check the uh, purchase record. Um, but it's up to the, either a professional engineer or that, that independent monitor to verify on an annual basis and on, and quarterly. Okay. And Kyle. Um, in the proposal from the task force, are organic waste-based feedstocks that generate biogas or liquid fuels eligible? Um, I can tell you that the task force did not address liquid fuel specifically. Um, and that, that sort of, in many cases, we'll get into uh, some other issues. Um, I can tell you that the Public Service Commission, um, and that's that's why I was particularly interested in, in uh, Elizabeth's presentation. Some of those decisions are ultimately going to be made by the Public Service Commission in terms of what they can enforce and verify. Um, I can tell you that um, at least in the interest of the task force as a whole, um, we try to be as inclusive as possible and make sure that as many clean technologies um, as were available uh, could qualify. But ultimately, that decision is going to come down to um, the folks at the Public Service Commission in Maryland. Hey, Kyle, here's a question you sort of um, gave an implicit answer to, but it would be good for you to state it out more explicitly. And that is, would the Maryland thermal requirements be in addition to the existing RPS, or would they, in effect, be a carve-out um, from the RPS reducing the amount of solar, I mean, the amount of um, electricity generated under the RPS? So as it was recommended by the task force, um, it, would be an, it would be both a carve out as well as additional. So it would be an additional 2% on top of the 20%, and that would be strictly for thermal technology. So everything other than, all qualifying technologies other than solar, hot water, would move over into this additional tier. Um, now that said, the discussions ongoing in um, the state Senate and House do not necessarily reflect that recommendation. So there, while the initial 
submission did uh, make it as an as additive, and that is what MEA and the task force will support. I'm I'm hearing that there are a number of discussions going on about whether or not it should be an incre incremental addition or if it should be something that should be incorporated. So I, I'm not fully up to speed on every moment of, of some of these senators and, uh, and House members' discussions, but I can tell you that um, as recommended by the task force and, and MEA, it would be additional. Great. And Liz, um, there's a question about geothermal heat pumps. How is the electricity use of the system itself taken into account over, over and above the 3.6% parasitical load? That includes the electricity for the heat pump. So that parasitic is any, any energy, extra energy used for the heat pump or other parts of that system. OK. And also, Liz, can you? elaborate on the mechanisms that thermal energy producers will be able to use to estimate thermal energy output retroactive to January 1? You know, that is, how were they going to deal with this time before they knew what the metering and other technical requirements would be? Right. Um, right now, what I envision they will be allowed to do is to basically use an estimation method like the small, so any size sources, or if they already have meters in place to use those. Um, and basically, an engineer will have to sign off that those are valid systems. OK. And, and if, if you are a biomass unit, you will have to meet um, the, the emission requirements as well. But there may be an option that you could request a waiver from those rules. But at this point, I know a lot of biomass facilities are scrambling so that come um, next quarter, they'll be able to be eligible. OK. Good. And here's a question for Kyle. Do you expect incentives for black liquor to be treated in a separate bill or removed in their entirety. This person um, who wrote in thought that um, she thought Gover Governor O'Malley was looking to phase out the use of black liquor. Uh, there are a number of initiatives going forward um, uh, as bills that are have been put before the the Senate and House that will potentially remove. Uh, black liquor from the RPS. So yes, to answer your question, there are a number of initiatives moving forward to do that. Um, that's not necessarily a part of this initiative, but it was an option um, for you know changing the way that we provided that incentive. Under, under the structure that the task force recommended, it would provide a significantly reduced um, incentive for black liquor technologies moving forward, I think, five years. But I, I think in the end, um, that's going to be a moot point, and they're going to separate um, those two initiatives. Um, so yes, uh, it's not necessarily something that I'm here to talk about today. I'm not representing the governor saying that we're going to be you know, removing black liquor from the RPS. But I do know of other initiatives put forward by legislators to um, remove that incentive. OK. And here's a question for both of you. And this person asked, do either of your states, Maryland or New Hampshire, have other incentives besides and outside of the RPS, things like rebates or loans, that can benefit uh, renewable thermal technologies? And if so, can you describe those? I can answer that. Um, in New Hampshire, yes, we have rebates and grants. Um, for thermal, uh, we basically have a residential solar thermal program and a residential wood pellet boiler rebate program. And we also have a commercial industrial solar thermal rebate program. And then we also have a grant program, which is a competitive grant program. And once a year, we issue a request for proposals. And essentially, if your facility does, is not eligible for a rebate, and um, for example, with the commercial and industrial, if your um, the rebate programs are for 100 kW and less, 
If you're over 100 kW, you can apply for our grant program, but it is a very competitive process. Uh, last year we had 35 proposals requesting over $21 million, and we were only able to issue uh, 10 grants valued at $3.8 million. Okay. And Marilyn, do you have any other incentives for renewable thermal at the moment, or do you envision having any in the future? We do. Um, so I, I guess I'll, we have both residential and commercial incentives. Um, I'll start with residential. Um, our, we have a wood stove program that offers uh, $400 um, for residential wood stoves that meet a certain efficiency requirement. 600 for, I'm sorry, it's 500 and 700. We actually increased those. Um, so 500 for wood stoves, 700 for pellet stoves. Um, solar hot water on a residential um, level between 10 and 100 square feet of capacity uh, is $500 a project. Um, and then uh, geothermal heating and cooling um, between 1 and 10 tons earns $3,000 per project. So. Um, we have a number of different incentives. All of them are, are um, on our website outside of the RPS. Um, and you know, we also offer, like I said, commercial. Um, but those, those numbers are a little more complicated. So. OK. And Kyle, in the case of New Hampshire, um, they're using um, the existing regional uh, rec tracking system for tracking the thermal recs. Would you envision that the Maryland thermal recs would be tracked through PJM GATS, which is used for tracking electricity renewable energy certificates for your RPS, or would you not track them that way? Um, I can tell you that um, while we haven't you know, set any of that stuff up and we would want to make sure that the Public Service Commission um, you know, ha had a role in making that decision, I can tell you that um, when this question did come up, um, that was the one of the options put forward. That was the sole option put forward, which was we already have a system for trading and evaluating um, and tracking uh, these recs. So you know, if we have the opportunity to use an existing system that everybody knows about, that that we would probably go about that as well. Okay. Now here's a question that came in for Kyle, but it actually applies to both states. So either of you. Well, both of you could answer them, answer these couple of questions. Um, the amount of thermal rec seems to be linked to electricity sales. Why not link it to the sales of heating fuels like natural gas or oil? Is that because electricity utilities are the regulated entity, um, or is there another reason? I, I can tell you that that is one of the reasons, you know, the, the compliance entity plays into that discussion. So you already have a regulated industry in, um, in our state utilities. Um, and trying to, I mean, I guess one way that you could go about um, having the, the regulated industry be those providers would be to open up new sets of regulations for propane distributors, um, fuel oil distributors, um, to a certain extent still the electric utilities as um, many of, of um, Marylanders heating and cooling needs are done you know, through electricity, whether it be you know, air source heat pumps, um, in some cases electric resistance heating. So they, they have a part to play, but yes, um, the challenge is who's the compliance entity and how do you attach that to um, a particular resource, uh, energy resource. OK. And Liz, um, this question person was asking about your uh, reduction in REC based on the issue of meter accuracy. What you said was that if there's a meter that has an accuracy of plus or minus 4%, then the number of recs it records would be reduced by 4%. But because the accuracy is plus or minus 4%, it's equally likely that the meter is under-reporting as it is that it's over-reporting. 
why then assume that it's over-reporting and reduce the number of wrecks for that reason? That's true, and I, I mean, I grappled with that issue, but ultimately we'd like the meters to meet those standards, but this is an alternative. Um, so if, if there's a simple way to do that, then we can do that, but um, this was the simplest way to present that alternative option. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to try to rephrase this for you, Kyle, and see if I understand it correctly and you could tell me um, if I understand it and then maybe the person who wrote in also understands that. This has to do with what you were saying about the ACP requirements and that the only alternative compliance payment would be for just the number of systems that are in place. Now, my understanding is a state puts in an alternative compliance payment to maximize the, to put a limit on what the price of the RECs could go to so that it can't go up to infinity. In the case of electricity racks, the theory is that an electricity um, supplier needs to get a certain share of their electricity from eligible technologies. And if they don't get enough, they still need to pay for what they were required to get. And that's in in their control, that they know one way or another they have to get a certain number of racks, either purchasing them or paying a alternative compliance payments for those number of racks. But in the case of the thermal, the electricity suppliers don't have control over how many systems get installed. And so for that reason, it doesn't make sense for them to be charged for um, systems that aren't installed, they should, the alternative compliance payment should only go for that number of systems that are actually producing heat. Now, I didn't say that very clearly, but do I sort of have that right, or can you explain it more clearly? Yeah, so um, that, it, it's a bit of an abstract concept, um, but I, I think you, you generally capture the gist of it. Um, the way that it would work in, in function, and very briefly and uh, um, you know, summed up easily, is um, if it was 2016, um, January 2016, um, and let's say this was to, to move forward and, and to be, the bill was to pass, um, let's say there's 10 different companies out there who develop projects that um, generate renewable energy credits. Let's say that the, um, the projected requirement for 2016 is 100 uh, thermal renewable energy credits. Um, if those companies, those 10 companies only generated um, five renewable energy credits uh, a piece and there were 10 companies, then, then you would have 50 renewable energy credits between, generated between January 1st of 2016 and um, December 31st of 2016. Um, each utility would be required to um, demonstrate compliance by April 2017. So they would have four months to take a look at the thermal rec market, say um, how many total recs were generated, thermal recs were generated in 2016. They would then be able to figure out what their requirement was. Let's um, and and to purchase those renewable ener energy credits accordingly. Uh, the alternative compliance payment basically um, establishes where the value of these RECs um, will be. Um, for some of the reasons that, that you had touched on in, in, in your introduction, um, but ultimately that, that purchasing period will, will likely be between January and April um, if the recommended uh, market structure goes forward. Okay, though. Well, we are coming to the end of our time. Um, I want to thank both 
Elizabeth and Kyle for their presentations. Um, it's clear that um, New Hampshire and Maryland are doing important pioneering work in a complicated new area, and it'll be very interesting to watch how things develop in those states. Um, I also want to thank Joseph Seymour and the Renewable Energy Markets Association for co-sponsoring this webinar and helping get the word out about it. Uh, we will have additional webinars in the future. And keep on the lookout for the report we'll be producing on renewable energy, thermal, renewable thermal energy in RPS. Um, one way to make sure you hear about that is to sign up to be on the mailing list for the RPS Collaborative. In any case, thank you all, and we will talk to you again next month. Bye now.